we started out in, in actually around the holidays in December. We did okay. a series of shows. We did a couple in Nashville, a couple in Colorado. It was basically a kind of a test. We wanted to test it out, try it out in front of people, see what it, see what happened. And it was just the, the response was so positive that we just said, yeah, let's 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 book some shows. So, John, how much fun are uh, did you have at the first show and how much fun is this for you to do something like this, uh, which is a little different from how some people uh, know you? Yeah, it's it's an amazing it's it's great for me to do this. I feel it balances out my life and career and my career, you know, uh, working with Daryl, you know, we've been we've we've you know, we've elevated uh, ourselves once again uh, you know, yeah, it's always been like a series of dips and you know, peaks and valleys. But now we're, you know, we're, we're, we're at a place where we play these huge arenas, big festivals, um, you know, 10, 15,000, 20,000 people. And uh, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that goes into the, a show like that. You know, it's big. It's big on all levels. The production, the, uh, the trucks, the buses, the people, you know, the, the video screens. And it's a um, it's a great show. The band is incredible. People love to hear the old hits. But at the same time, um, you know, I've made a lot of music in my life. I've I've made seven solo albums. Um, I had an entire musical life before I met Daryl Hall. You know, I started playing and singing as a baby, basically, as a little kid. Uh, and I was on stage from the time I was four years old. Wow. Uh, so um, moving to Nashville, I mean, I'm going to kind of condense this long, drawn out story as best I can. Uh, moving to Nashville, you know, going there in the late 90s, moving there in the, in the early 2000s. All of a sudden, I became part of the Americana community and uh, became uh, friendly and began to work with a lot of people who had very similar uh, musical upbringing and roots, uh, early rock and roll, uh, music that, that transcended rock and roll. Uh, you know, I'm old enough to remember music before rock and roll. My parents were from the, the World War II generation. You know, I, the first music I remember hearing was swing and big band and ragtime mm -hmm. and things like that. So, um, you know, and then my life, my early life as a, as a young kid parallels the evolution of rock and roll from the very beginning. Uh, and, you know, then the folk revival hit in the early 60s, and I was right in the middle of it in Philadelphia, learning from the directly from some of the people and getting to see them perform live. Mississippi John Hurt, Doc Watson, Sonny Terry, Brownie McGee, all, all the great, all the greats. And um, then I was at the Uptown Theater in Philadelphia, watching the great R&B and soul performers of the era, you know, um, Stevie Wonder. I saw Stevie Wonder do fingertips when he was 12 years wow. old. You know, that was, that was Dave, little Stevie Wonder, right? That's right, little Stevie Wonder. He played all the instruments. Um, you know, Sam and Dave, Otis Redding, the Temptations, the Delphonics, the local Philadelphia groups, um, and so the, it was this amazing amalgamation of, and really, what it really was was American roots music. It was the roots of rock and roll. In you know, before it was, you know, it was it was definitely in two different camps but not too far apart. And it hadn't been seg segmented, segmented by mm -hmm. the commercial uh, music business and by commercial radio. So who I am is an amalgamation of all that. That's, that's where my musical DNA comes from. And in our collaboration, you know, together with Daryl and I, you know, both of us, both of us shelved portions of our early musical influences in order to create something that was, greater than the sum of its parts. We, you know, he and I both became something else. Yeah. And that else, that something that we became was Fallen Oats. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that I forgot about who I was before that. Yeah. And this type of show gives me an opportunity to showcase that and tell this story in a musical and chronological way, sort of. And tell us about uh, the, the gentleman you're going to be playing with, Guthrie Trap. I was going to call him Gunther, but it's Guthrie Trap. <laughs> yes, uh, Guthrie. A very talented musician in his own right. We've been friends for over 15 years. We met at the Telluride Bluegrass Festival. Uh, he's younger than me, but grew up in a, in a family where his parents are kind of my age. And they influenced him with the exact same influences that I was having contemporarily. So interestingly enough, when we got together and met and began to play together, we realized we had all this similar, musical similarity. And we draw on that. We draw on the similar uh, influences when we play together. And he's just such a great musician. He's a super gifted guitar player. And he's also very intuitive. And in addition to being flashy and, and really able to bring a, a whole higher level of instrument uh, skill, he's also a great accompanist, which is also a very... Uh, 
subtle and unappreciated skill that a lot of people don't understand. But when you're a singer and a songwriter and you have a great accompanist, it really can, it changes your whole performance. You all obviously play off of each other. So, I mean, every night might be the same show, but is it really not the same show every night? It's never the same. That's a, we do, we have a set list, uh, we go through it because uh, the reason we, we do even have a set list is because there's a, there's a story that, that I tell from the very beginning. Uh, I'm, you know, and just to give you a general idea, um, the first song we play is a song that's probably the first song that I ever played on guitar and sang at the same time when I was just getting good enough to do that at about eight or nine years old. Um, and I tell that story and then that kind of sets, sets the table. And then we move through a lot of our, uh, mutual influences, Doc Watson, Mississippi, John Hurt, people like that. And then we, we, you know, I, I try to tie it together and I begin to play some of the songs that are more recent collaborations and newer songs that are on my, I've had seven solo albums, so I have a lot of material. And people began to see, oh, okay, he learned from these guys. Oh, he learned, oh, he played Mississippi John Hurt and Doc Watson. Now he's playing this new song that I've never heard, but I hear the influences. So I'm really trying to, to make it, you know, to bring it together in that way, uh, make the connection. And then of course, you know, um, I play, you know, then we, we move in at the end, we move into the, some of the Hall Notes hits and which we do in a, you know, in a reimagined uh, acoustic way. So I think that, you know, when you get the, the full impact of the show gives people a lot. Uh, it gives them this sense of who I might be as an individual. And I'm not, I'm not just the guy that jumped around in the MTV videos, you know, um, and then it shows that there's a real continuum and a link between how it started for me personally and where it ended up when I began to collaborate with Daryl. Now, I, I've read something that you all, you use the term Hall and Oates, but you prefer Daryl Hall and John Oates. Is that correct? Yeah. Because you're two individuals. Yeah. Is, that, is that correct? It's always been like that. If you look at our albums, every album we've ever had from the very, very beginning, uh, it says Daryl Hall and John Oates. And we made a conscious decision about that very early on, which I'm, I'm quite proud of, to be honest with you, because we wanted to be perceived as two individuals who work together, not uh, not this, uh, you know, kind of joined at the hip duo who could not, you know, whose who's creative life was limited to um, to that configuration. We we just never saw ourselves that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, Daryl Daryl's made numerous solo albums and he's, and he does his thing, I do my thing. And, and I think that's also part of the reason we were able to stay together for so long. I was gonna say, it's been uh, probably 50, almost exactly 50 years. How do you stay together? I mean, bands break up after two, three years and you guys have been together, separate, but kind of together for 50 years. How does, how does that happen? Well, I like to believe it's, it, has a, it has something to do with a mutual respect for, um, for our creative and musicianship, um, which I certainly have for Daryl. Uh, and, um, also because we met as teenagers and we experienced our young adult life together in every, every way, really uh, from, you know, the professional side to the, to the creative side, to the ups and downs, to the challenges, uh, to the successes. And so we have this, um, it's almost like being a brother, really. Uh, it's almost, it's being part of a family and it's like having a brother. You don't, you don't really have to be best friends with your brother, but there's always this unshakable bond. Are you the best version of yourself so far? Do you keep getting better as a musician? Absolutely. I believe I'm playing right now at uh, a level that I've never, ever played at before. Um, and a lot of it has to do with because I've, I've, ex I've, I've settled into playing in an area that I'm so comfortable in, something that I've been doing my whole life, literally for 60 years that it's, it's, it's effortless for me to do this. Mm -hmm. And then to have a, a partner like Guthrie who can augment and enhance what I'm doing just makes it even better. So you are obviously a singer, a songwriter, a producer. What would you consider, <clears throat> I know you're, you're good at all of them, but would you consider one of those facets better than the others? I don't know, I, I that's a question. I, um, I, it depends on the moment. Um, okay. You know, it depends on which hat I'm wearing, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I think one thing that, I'm, that I, I feel like I'm really pretty good at, which I never considered, uh, you, you know, over the years, I'm a pretty good arranger. I can take other people's music and arrange it. 
in different ways and to suit, well, to suit myself personally, if I want to do a cover song by someone, for instance, I have a knack for rearranging uh, music. And uh, it's something that I never even thought about, but I've gone, you know, I do a couple songs that are some real chestnuts, some real, you know, um, famous uh, songs that, that I've taken and tried to make them my own. And in making them my own, I've had to rearrange them to suit suit how I play and how I sing. So it's um, something that I never used to do, uh, but I do a lot now. The one thing that I don't know if you're good at is dancing. So uh, I don't know if you're a clock <laughs> tool or how, how's the dance, how would you rate the dancing? Um, well, you know, when I was a teenager coming from Philadelphia, you know, if you didn't dance, you were nothing. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you American bandstand, Jerry Blavitt, the Geeter with the heater. I mean, I used to go to the to Jerry Blavitt's uh, record hops, you know, at, at the at Wagner's and at the Chez Vu Ballroom. Um, I used to dance. Oh, I just did the mashed potatoes and all the line dances and all that stuff. The stomp. Oh yeah, I used to do all that. I don't do it anymore. I, I'm definitely, um, definitely put the dancing a little bit behind me. And you were a wrestler, so I don't know if that helped or hurt dancing. But I, I read that you were a wrestler back in the. Yeah, hey, I don't know. I don't know if it helped or hurt dancing, but it I definitely helped my body because <laughs> I think the strength, uh, the strength uh, base that I build up as a wrestler has stayed with me for the rest of my life. And I've, I've always been athletic and I've always been uh, outdoors and I've always been, um, I've always, and I've always been into fitness. It's a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. So music is your vocation. Is it also your avocation? I've talked to, I'll give you an example, golfers, you know, you know, I love playing golf, but golfers, when they're getting away, they don't want to necessarily play golf. So is it a vocation and an avocation or just a vocation for you? It's, it's both. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't listen to music very often. Yeah. Um, when I'm in a car, I always listen to talk radio. I'm always listening to the news or uh, to podcasts and things like that. I'm a, I'm a big history buff. I listen to history podcasts in particular. But, um, I only, you know, the, but, the, but the thing is, that one of the reasons I don't really listen to music is because I have to when I hear music, I hear it analytically. Um, mm -hmm. I don't let it wash. It, it can't just wash over me and ignore it. Uh, I hate background music. That drives me absolutely insane because I can't hear it. And then, but then if I hear it, I have to actually listen to it. Then I listen to it in, in, in a, you know, as a producer would listen or as a songwriter would listen or as a singer would listen. I listen for the production or the, the arrangement or whatever. So um, listening to music as for fun is not that fun, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, so, uh, but, but then again, I'm always listening to music because people are sending me stuff or I'm working on a new song or I'm working on a project. So if I'm listening to music, I'm usually listening to something I'm actually involved in. Okay. Um, so you're in probably lots of halls of fame, but two of them are the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Songwriting Hall of Fame. Does either one of them mean more to you than the other? Yeah, I mean, if you're leading to the Dolly Parton question, yes. Um, the Songwriters Hall of Fame, absolutely. Uh, it, first of all, it happened prior to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And what I would say is that uh, um, had we not written the songs we wrote, we would never be in a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, everything starts with a song. Uh, to be honored in that elite group of American songwriters, you know, which goes back to, you know, George Gershwin and Cole Porter and the Brill Building and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, this is a, a very, um, you know, very elite and very um, impressive group of people who really changed the world, to be honest with you, because American popular song is probably the greatest, one of the greatest exports that America has ever given the world. There's no negatives, negative negativity involved in it. It has shaped culture around the world. Uh, it has created the American brand in, a, in an essence, socially. Um, and to be part of that, even a, a, you know, a, a large part or small part, it doesn't matter. To be part of that is, is very, very, um, you know, I'm very proud of that. Uh, and, you know, being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know, it was great for our career. It gives you a lot of notoriety, a lot of, you get a lot of awareness in the media. Um, and, and yes, it was, it was definitely an asset to our live shows and things like that. By the same token, uh, I understand what Dolly Parton's saying completely. Um, and I understand her, um, you know, reluctance to want to be part of it. Uh, she doesn't need it. She, she is her, her, Dolly Parton is her own rock and roll hall of fame. She's her own music hall of fame. She's, she's an icon uh, her, her 
career, her songwriting, her charitable work, everything she's ever done far supersedes any kind of um, bowling trophy that could be given to her. Um, she's, she's above all that. Um, and uh, I just have the ultimate respect for her. Actually, Guthrie, uh, Guthrie Trapp uh, played with Dolly. Oh. And uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a fan, obviously. Yeah, so for, for those that don't know, Dolly Parton uh, declined the, the nomination into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is kind of stunning because there was controversy because she's not, you know, literally rock and roll. So, but w when you heard that she did that, it's it's on brand with what we know of Dolly. I don't know her personally, but what what did you think when you saw that? I I said, good good for you. You know, stand. You know, that's one thing she's never done. She's never backed down from from any kind of uh, controversy or any kind of. Uh, Truth telling. She's a she's a she's a an ultimate truth teller. As as are many of the great great country songwriters. You know the old cliche of three three chords and the truth. There's a real um, there's a real you know kind of purity in in being able to tell personal stories and to be able to communicate something that's very powerful in a very simple and direct way. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know Dolly Parton among the the other great country songwriters are all exponents of that style on your uh twitter uh site um I'm, I'm using part of a quote i find that the story of creating something is much more interesting than taking a victory lap i think i know what that means but can you tell us what that means well i came up with that that the line uh, during when i wrote my book of change of season everyone you know expected this big uh, you know the story of the of the big 80s you know the the MTV videos, the running around the world, the big giant number one records, the platinum albums. I think people probably expected that. And what they got was something completely different. I focused a lot in the book on the 70s. And um, the fact that I had kept a series of journals through the entire decade of the 70s when I graduated from college, I, I actually began the journals the day I graduated from college because uh, I thought to myself, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Uh, Daryl and I weren't a, a team at the time. We knew each other, but we weren't working together. Um, I didn't know whether there was going to be such a thing as Fallen Oats. I had no idea where I'd end up. Um, I knew I'd be a musician in some way, shape, or form. And so I thought, whatever happens to me going forward is going to shape my life, basically. And it did. It's uh, it, the, the collab, you know, getting together with Daryl shortly thereafter, after graduating and uh, working with him. And that story of how it happened. I find, you know, I think, and I think people should should also think that it's much more interesting than hearing about how many hits we had or how right. many platinum albums we had or how many sold out shows we had. And so I wanted to tell that story because it's not very well known. And um, that was my, uh, that's why I said what I said. So reading that quote made me think about Ricky Nelson. And I think you know where I'm going to go, his song Garden Party. And if, uh, I think it was early 70s. And it was about yeah. a concert at Madison Square Garden. And the lyrics are something to the effect, I went to a garden party to reminisce with some old friends. Uh, yeah. And then something about I'd rather, I'd rather drive a truck than basically sing all the old songs. Uh, or, or, you know, uh, is, is there something, is there a similarity there to, to what he sang about in that song? Uh, Yes and no. I mean, I understand, you know, his frustration, but you have to take it in the context of who he really was. He yeah. was a child star. He was on television. Right. Um, you know, he was one of the big, on one of the biggest shows on television in the history of American television. Um, and so I'm sure that by the time he got around to being a pop star and, you know, let's face it, you know, he was a great looking guy. He was, uh, he was on the coattails of Elvis. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he was definitely talented. There's no doubt about it. He, Christ, he had James Burton in his band. <laughs> so, you know, uh, but but um, I do not. But, but that's where the similarity stops. And, and, you know, I understand. I think I can understand where he was coming from. Yeah. But as far as I'm concerned, um, I'm really proud of the music that Daryl and I made. Um, the fact that we have so many hits is like probably the biggest one of the greatest problems that uh, any, any musical artist can ever have. I, I can do the show that I'm doing right now because of the commercial success that I've had with Daryl and those hits. They have provided me with a creative freedom that very few um, people ever can attain. So I, I, I'm totally respectful of it. I, I never, ever put it down. And luckily, the songs have stood the test of time. They sound good. They don't sound dated. 
They don't sound like period pieces or nostalgia. And we don't play them with that attitude. Our band is very aggressive. We, we re, reimagine some of the songs. If you were to compare the records that we made, you know, you take Sarah Smile or even She's Gone or many, any of these songs, and you were to back to play them back to back with a live interpretation from right now of what we're doing right now as the whole, you know, the whole note show, you almost wouldn't recognize the songs other than the fact that the lyrics are the same, the title is the same, the melodies are almost similar, mm -hmm. and the vibe is the same. But in terms of aping, aping our past, trying to recreate our past, yeah. uh, trying to recreate the sound of old records, that's a that's a loser's game. Um, yeah. Live music should be a, 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 a recreation of, of what of what the recordings are, not a not some sort of replication. Is that a, also reinterpretation? Is that uh, would you absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and here again, I'll go back to the. It comes to, you know, especially uh, comes back to me from the shows I saw at the Uptown Theater. You know, I as a, I was a kid, I was a teenager, you know, I'm a giant fan. I go, I go, I go wanting to see The Temptations and I want to hear Ain't Too Proud to Beg and My Girl and all that. And sure, I heard those same songs, but they didn't sound like the record. The tempos were quicker. The energy was elevated to a whole different level. Um, there were moments in the in their performance where they deviated from the actual song and stretched that's my that's my template for what a live show should be um and that's what daryl and i do tell me why why should people come to the show so you're not doing the old you're doing reimaginations of the old ones so why should people come uh, next thursday to the bethesda uh, blues and jazz supper club a number of reasons um, if you uh, if you like guitar playing, you're going to love this show. If you like, if you want to know, um, one thing I've realized about this show and doing it, I can play obscure songs in this show, and people respond to them the same way they respond to their familiar hits. Mm -hmm. And but there's a reason for it. It's because I put them into context before I play them, mm -hmm. and I give people a context, a backstory, a history, and I make the song meaningful so that even though they're hearing a song that they've never heard before, they respond to it as though it's familiar. And that's the magic of the show. And that's what the show is all about. It's really about, um, a, you know, and then, you know, from another point of view, it's a chance for, pe me, for people, if they care enough to see who I really am as a musician, because this show showcases my individual personality in the best possible way. Um, I'm, I'm able to be myself. I'm able to be myself personally, you know, when I talk to the audience and we have this amazing rapport between Guthrie and I. And also it, it showcases what I think I do best, which is acoustic guitar playing. I'm a better acoustic guitar player th than I am an electric guitar player. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I love both, but I, I my acoustic guitar is my sweet spot. So this show, uh, it really, it strips away all the artifice. It strips away all the uh, showbiz aspects of any, of any kind of live performance and it's as natural and as authentic as as it is possible can you uh specify some of the 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 genres it's it's a little blues would you say a little uh is it delta what, how, what, what genres do you guys touch on um well i have another quote that i've been using it's like it's like uh it's like dixieland dipped in bluegrass and salted with delta blues uh, a it's, it's a little bit of, I mean, honestly, it's everything. We play ragtime, we play swing, we play, um, we play Doc Watson, finger picking Appalachian stuff. Uh, and then we blend it into, into a series of songs that are more contemporary songs that I more re or have been written more recently. Um, that, uh, you know, that, and people all of a sudden they get, they get it because if I were to just come out and play this brand new song that I wrote a year ago or whatever, and not say a word about it, people would just sit there and they'd be appreciative and I'm sure they'd be respectful. But when they, the way we set the show up, it, it, it's a chronology. It's a, it's a musical time trip. And the way it's set up, when we finally get to these new songs that they've never heard before, there's a, there's a context that is created. And then I honestly, and, and I get the same response on every one of these shows. 
well, I'm so glad you played Man Eater or Out of Touch or, or She's Gone. We, we, we love those songs. But the songs you played before are so cool. I had no idea. Everyone says the same thing. They really appreciate hearing this new stuff. It's fresh for them. And it's fresh because of the way we present it. Is it in a sense, is the show in a sense a book with individual stories, a chrono chronology yes. of, of your career you could, in a sense? You could look at it that way. Absolutely, you could look at it that way. And, and the setting, is, is it sort of a fireside chat, kind of living room, comfortable, like welcome to my house kind of thing? Uh, th that was the concept for the show. Guthrie and I were playing at home uh, with two acoustic guitars, which we do for fun. And we, it sounded so good and we were having so much fun. We said, wouldn't it be cool if we just take this on the stage? How can we do that? And, and we looked at each other and we said, let's just take the living room and on the stage. So we show up, we've got a rug, we've got a table, we've got a lamp, we've got two, two stools, two acoustic guitars, and we sing and play. So you're inviting us into your living room. Sounds like it's going to be a great show, John. I have to ask one question about a, a, a Hall & Oates song or a, a uh, Daryl Hall, John Oates song. Forgive me for saying Hall & Oates. Um, Maneater. So you are playing that in this show. I yep. need to know, please, is that a, about one person? Is it made up? Is it a com combination of people? Who is that song about, if, if I may ask? Well, I, I think before I answer, I will answer that question. But before I do, I think maybe the average person thinks that songwriters um, are always writing about something that's very um, clear and, and uh, very, uh, very kind of, um, I don't know what the best way to put it. Uh, well, let's put it this way. I think a lot of people would really be surprised and shocked if they actually knew where some of the inspirations and where the songwriters, what the songwriters were actually thinking about when they wrote those songs, uh, because they're not always this pure kind of inspiration. And, Oh, I saw a girl walking down the street and I'm going to write a song about a girl walking down the street. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, to answer your question, um, man eater was inspired. I, there was a hangout in, in the West village in the eighties that we used to hang out in a late night hang. And I was sitting with a table with a friends and I tell this story on stage very, in a very similar way. And this gal came in, she was absolutely drop dead gorgeous. And the first thing she did was open her mouth and tell the filthy joke. And she, she had a really filthy vocabulary. And I was like, I was laughing and kind of shocked and surprised at, at the, uh, you know, the, the contrast between her great beauty and her, um, the way she spoke. And so uh, on my way home that night, I was saying to myself, man, she, the girl like that would chew you up and spit you out. And I thought, she's a man eater. And I said, wow. So I wrote this chorus and it was kind of this reggae feel. Um, I had just come back from Jamaica. That's what I was thinking about. I played it for Daryl and he really liked it. And he said, man, I said, I, he goes, I don't know about the reggae thing. What, what, what if we change it to this groove? And he came up with the piano groove. Um, and then as we began to write, and I told him that same story. And as we began to write, we both looked at each other and said, we don't want to be writing about a woman. That's not cool. And then we looked around and it was the middle of the, the you know, the go-go 80s, you know, the hyper jacked up uh, period of time where similar to the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, we, that you'd see in that depiction. And we said, New York is the place that's going to chew you up and spit you out. That's a city that will chew you up and spit you out. And so we wrote that song as a metaphor for New York. And of course, it, it always songs always connect when you can make a universal concept person. Um, they, they, they always seem to connect better. Uh, and I'll give you another quick example. It's not a song that I play, but uh, the song Kiss on My List. Yeah. A lot of people think it's Kiss on My Lips. Well, it's not. It's, it's Kiss on My List, and it's your kiss is on my list of the best things in life, not necessarily the best thing in life. Now, a lot of people take that as a romantic song. It's not a romantic song at all. Um, there's, there's, and, and that goes on every, every composition. There's, every song has a story like that. And... Uh, there's a lot more going on, on in, in the lyrics of these uh, songs than, than you may uh, think on the surface. That's a great story. And if you want to hear more of those, uh, go see Guthrie uh, Trap and John Oates at Bethesda Blues and Jazz Supper Club uh, next Thursday. John, cannot thank you enough. This has been a great joy for me. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, that was a good interview, Joe. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. That was great. All right.